entry. Oh, we got a car up at the wall. This is why the car went low. Robinson went down to avoid this Porsche 911 that has hit the wall hard on the right side. And, and this will be a full course yellow because that car in a very bad spot in between NASCAR 4 and the Tri-Oval where the, uh, the Can-Am cars would be on average at about 185 miles an hour. There you see number 69, the GT3 Porsche. We can't get a good look at the right side of that car, so we don't know exactly what's happened, whether he got pushed up into the wall or a car coming by, by him clipped the right front corner. There you see the flags, full course yellow. Thierry Perrier of France driving with Jean-Louis Ricci, an experienced sports car driver and an heir to the Nina Ricci fortune. Meanwhile, up front, James Weaver waving his hand. He looks angry about something. This is our first full course caution. As a result, perhaps everybody's not minding yellow flag procedures as they've been told to in the driver's meetings. There's Perrier up against the wall. He has passed the pit entrance up in the tri-oval area. Well, undoubtedly, they'll go and put a tow truck on that car and pull him right into the pits. There you see he's just in front of the pit entrance. So they'll probably pull that car down pit lane and it'll give the crew an opportunity to have a look at it and see if they can fix it. I was wrong. He could make the pit entrance. Let's take another look. Now, there's Robinson going down low on the left side of your screen. There is the end of the contact for Perrier. And I just, it's very unusual for the GT3 cars. The GT3 runners are always told in the driver's meeting to stay low, let the faster cars go by on the high side on the banking. Very unusual to see that car up out on the outside there. Those cars come off turn four of the NASCAR Oval at about 160 miles an hour. And that, as the NASCAR boys might say, was some lick. Our two-time champions in the GT3 category from PTGPFL, we got a car off. That's the number 63, Jim Downing Mazda Kudzu. And we had reports that the rear wing might be loose and flapping around on that car. Well, you can see that wing is not mounted with, uh, you know, it's on those two. Oh, look at that, that bunch of grass he just dumped there, right in the middle of that corner. I'll tell you what, if they don't get that debris flag up, someone is going to go off the road there. If they don't put a debris flag up, that's really going to catch someone out. That's Howard Katz from New York City driving, sharing driving chores with the car's owner and builder, Jim Downing, Chris Ronson, and Yohiro Tarada of Japan. 23 countries from around the world represented in the 330 or so drivers competing in this year's race. And Jim Downing, of course, famous for rotary power. This car that you see here, that's down in NASCAR turn one. Alan McNish was back on the radio telling the team there was a problem in the banking. Car number 58, a Porsche 993. Peterson Motorsports. This is an interesting lineup. Angelo Seeley, Tom Miller, Michael Peterson, John Ruther, and Dale White, a very accomplished off-road racer. Angelo Seeley is the driver right now. Dale White on the team's strength, a three-time winner of the Baja 1000. And this team has great plans, including NASCAR Craftsman trucks and possibly a Winston Cup team in the future. And right now, they have severely redesigned the left side of that Porsche. And we understand they're going full course caution. Let's look at a replay here, and this is the back end of it, but he gets sideways and hooks it back up the banking, and a very hard hit in NASCAR turn one there. And I would say that car's probably done because that was a big, big hit. The second car appeared to be involved. He was in the vicinity. I didn't quite get that number. It looked like it had been car number 60, perhaps. No, it wouldn't have been 60. Now, this is on board with McNish. You can see the wreck happening up ahead of him here. You can see his finger on the button there. He's on the radio already as it's happening, and he drives right through it. Not a big danger to McNish there, but certainly calling back to the team as it's happening, giving them the play-by-play. -play. Makes it all the more remarkable. His voice was so even as he was reporting that potential shamazel up there on the banking. You'd think these guys would be screaming. Second full course caution of the day, and we're still in the first hour. Ferrari 333 SP. He's been in that car since the beginning of the race, almost an hour and a half ago. There's the car off the racetrack. We've been watching that for a while. That's Kurt Bauman from Virginia and a Chevy-powered Kudzu. 
And we've got a good replay here. Here he is going by some lap traffic, kind of drops a wheel, gets in a little hot here, and just loops it, gets it locked up, but not in time, and goes in and touches that barrier. When he drove it out, he ripped the rear wing off it, so it doesn't have a rear wing now. And it looks like it's crabbing a little bit. So I would say the alignment has been solidly knocked out of whack. So if that car, oh yeah, that, that right rear corner is in rough shape. 78 having problems. And this looks like it's down in turn one. That's another one-off creation called a Norma M14 with Buick Power for Sylvain Boulay, Eric Van de Weber, Patrice Roussel of France, and Edouard Sensionale from Largo, Florida. in the Can-Am division, guys. Oops, someone got the pointy end going in the wrong direction there. Excess fuel burning at the exhaust pipe there. That shouldn't be a problem, but... Uh, it's not a problem until you get it, uh, uh, unless you don't get it fired up. If, light you don't get it, if you don't get it fired up quickly, it's going to light that bodywork on fire. So he needs to get it fired up very quickly because that bodywork will burn. We've had a couple of cars off the road here. This is, these are the, the two GT3 leaders following a Can-Am car here into, it must be very slick down there in that hairpin, just gets a little wide of that, of that apex and loops it, quite harmless, but then a, a Mazda GT3 car followed him in after that and center punched one of those cones. So you can see he's just a little wide there, and once you get out wide there, it gets very dirty, gets those brakes locked up very quickly, no harm done. And now we have yellow flags from the flag stand. Our third full course caution. Riding with the GT3, Yokohama, BMW, Boris said at the controls of the number six car leading the class. And that actually, that position changed just while we were away at break. Kurt Wagner had been leading the number six car. And that position just recently changed. You can see he's only listed as a half second back there. In fact, the top six cars in class are all on the same lap. Meanwhile, our GTT leader, the number 19 Ford Mustang, is on its own lap. While the number seven car back in the race lead, let's go to Bill Weber. With Alan McNish. Car racing is not at the level of, say, Winston Cup or open wheeled racing. And he was asked whether or not. Oh, contact on the infield. And we were looking at the battle there for seventh between the number three and the number eight car. This car was being lapped. And wondering, what did I do wrong? Number 15. That's O'Reilly and Scott Ford being shared by Didier Andre, Ross Bentley, who is the reigning GT3 driving champion, Chris Bingham and Frank Freon. And he's really, he's left some room, you can see, but that was a real hard body slam there. And I gotta wonder about that eight car. If we don't, we're not gonna have some alignment problems on that car. Take another look from another angle. Here comes the number eight. And he just gets pinched down. Simple collision. And the A car really made a commitment to go through there. It's quite possible whoever's in the 15 car, I don't recognize that helmet, just didn't know the car was there. We think it's Bingham in that car, in the 15 car. Chris Bingham from Bellevue, Washington. The number eight car is another Riley and Scott Ford being shared by Henry Camperdam, Duncan Dayton, and Scott Schubach, the former driving champion in the series. And I believe they added uh, Aliseo Salazar to that uh, driver lineup. That's right. And I think uh, Salazar started the car, so he's probably not in the car right now. We haven't had a good look at the eight car. So we'll have to see if the 15 car heads for pit lane. You can certainly see the front radiator there, the screen across the front, completely plugged up with grass. So if that car doesn't go to the pit lane, it is going to overheat very quickly. And from Marietta, Georgia, climbing in. Well, the spinner up on the 31-degree banking just at the entrance to NASCAR Turn 1. The number 87 car is a Chevy Camaro in the GTT category. Looks like that car might have escaped. Back live at Daytona as the Rolex 24 continues. James Weaver. 
with the Dyson Racing Riley and Scott Ford out front by a comfortable four and a half seconds now over the second place Ferrari in the hands of Didier Diradi. Now moments ago we saw one of the GTT class Chevy Camaros spin on the entrance to the banking at NASCAR one. Let's take a ride along the class leading BMW. And that's P.D. Cunningham in that car, the number six BMW. Look at this as we go to slow motion here. Look at where that car is. And he's just hoping that car's still rolling up the banking and hasn't stopped and is rolling back down. If he'd done one of those days of thunder, go for the middle of the cloud jobs, that would have been tough. Now on board with the GT2 class leader, David Donahue in the Dodge Viper. Here comes the second place Can-Am. Well, little, little traffic there, and he gets it a little bit hot, goes to power, and loops it. No harm done. Lost a bit of time. And we understand we're under full course caution here. We are indeed. The flags wave from the flag stand. I'm not sure the reason why just now. As you look at David Donahue, son of the great Mark Donahue, a winner of this race. Once again, the yellow flies in the third hour of car number 55 of Porsche 911 for a combined German, Swiss, and French team. There you see the Proton competition, 911 GT2, Gerald Reed, Gerald Rook, Tony Seiler, and Patrick Villon spun, and that was about a minute ago. He's having trouble getting that car relit. Boy, he's not in a very good spot either. That's uh, a big passing area coming out of that corner. Heavy acceleration just before the kink on the infield. Well, you can see the safety vehicles there, and this is probably not a situation, at least here the visibility is good. If the car has been there for a lap or two, everyone knows it's there. So it's not a big deal to go and put a rope on that car and just to pull it, uh, you know, to a safe place without going to a full course yellow or anything like that. Of course, the team would like to get the car back. Now another car slowing. There's the Kyler, the car number 60. We took a closer look earlier, and he is down on the apron in the banking. Tim Moser, Chris Wilson, Barry Waddell, a Kyler Ford, and that, it appears, will bring out the yellow flags so that officials can go out and retrieve these two stopped cars. Another note on that number two Corvette, while in the pits, it lost the position to our GT3 class leading Porsche, so the three class leads the two class. Next time the 83 car comes around, the Corvette will lose the lead. And you can see Whoops, a car there. A spinner back on the back stretch. Yeah, you can see a car there coming off. That's one of the Ferrari 355 GT3 cars. You see how slippery it is. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> barely moving and not even slowing down. That's a number four, uh, 42 GT3 car for a team of Italians. Is that the 83 car there? No, no, no. That's 77, I think. Oh. That's one of the Can-Am cars. Chris Neifel in a car with... 11 a this is a privateer Porsche, uh, Por Corvette that is, car number 44 running in the GT3 class. And if he gets past our camera position, you'll see that this car is showing some scars. Look at the rear of this thing. And yeah, this thing's in rough shape. Completely lost the rear hatch. Fully ventilated in the rear. But getting back to what I was saying, if you were to put Chris Neifel in a car with a guy like Alan McNish, mm -hmm. you'd have some real packaging problems. Here's a replay of this Corvette. This is back in the chicane, the bus stop chicane. And just gets it sideways at the first apex. Gets it locked up pretty quickly, which is good. And then get, gets back to power once it's pointed in the right direction. That is probably very close to a box stock Corvette out there running in the GT3 class. Marty Reed. Spin for the 95, Riley and Scott. Has he lost the fire? Tom Volt, the car owner, looking around. Presumably looking for a hole in traffic, which would indicate maybe he's ready to start rolling again. You would think so, but boy, there's no indication. You know, often when they click it into gear, you see the car just lurch a little bit. There, there he goes. This is their first Rolex 24 with this Riley and Scott, the Chevy Power. They raced a kudzu chassis last year from Jim Downing's Atlanta shops. Well, that car showing the scars of battle. Back on their way, no yellow flag. And while the battle continues up front, just one lap apart, our race leaders from Dyson Racing and the pursuers from Olive Garden Ferrari.
And all of the pit crews are heading out into the lane now to welcome everyone home. They're all out of the grab. Bob Leitzinger telling Butch the team is out on the grass. And now flagman Dean Reed pulls out the checkers. And for the 37th time, victory go, team. at Way the Rolex. For the second time, it goes to Dyson Racing and Butch Leitzinger driving the car under the checkered flag. Unofficially finishing in second place, two laps down, will be the Doyle Reese Ferrari. And the Corvettes come across the finish line side by side. Congratulations to Dyson Racing. A spectacular effort under conditions that have changed throughout the 24 hours. And this is something I've never seen before. No, I've never seen Iron anything Pit like... Lane is going out to the racetrack in the tri-oval. No, I've never seen anything like this. I've seen them up on the edge of the grass, but everyone is walking out there. And given the way it's raining, they couldn't have less reason. Well, this is truly something special here at Daytona. The downing cars, Mazda powered, come across the line in echelon style. Fully half the field finish the race in the garage. But the other half are on the racetrack, and those who aren't racing are out here cheering home the winners. And I'll tell you what, here's a big group of cars. All together with headlights flashing. Parading across the finish line from BMW and Ferrari. From Porsche, the winningest brand ever here. Six Porsches coming across together. And the Can-Am machines, 24 hours long expired. And this one is in the books. But now the celebrations will begin in Victory Lane at Daytona, where all the greats have come and sprayed the champagne and waved to the crowd. Dyson Racing will do that, as will our winners in GT3, GT2, and GTT. We'll talk to all of them. Stay with us. Hi. Back live at a very wet and raining Daytona International Speedway, where by three laps, our winners from Dyson Racing missed the overall distance record for the Can-Am class here at the Rolex 24. 708 laps complete. The record was 711. But the rain has not dampened the enthusiasm or the celebrations going on up and down the pit lane. Four classes, four sets of winners, four sets of podium finishers. And with 78 cars in this race, 78 stories to tell. There's the Dyson team climbing aboard. Giving that car. That's not the normal ride height, by the way, on that car. <laughs> A greater physical challenge than it has faced in the last 24 hours. And into victory lane, they will go with a little assist. They don't have quite the turning radius they need. What a great job for this team, who has come so close to winning in the past, only to see it slip from them. And then came back in 1997 to win, and I'm sure this one is every bit as sweet. There's a picture you'll see in all sorts of enthusiast magazines in the weeks to come. And for the final time, that Lozano Brothers 5.1 liter Ford V8 runs silent. Bill Weber is in victory lane. And it's a very emotional victory lane, as you might imagine. Lots of hugs and handshakes and a big celebration. Butch Leitzinger bringing the car home for Rob Dyson. And there's a big hug. He's got the helmet on. Lots of his co-drivers down here. We'll start with Butch. Butch, first of all, Congratulations. I know the first one's sweet, but I know this means a lot. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, I mean, this was the, I mean, 
th this was the example of a total team effort. Andy and Elliot were fantastic, and especially the, uh, the end in the rain. I don't know how you guys did that. I, I actually shoved my uh, spot off to Andy because I didn't want to go out in it. How did you do that, Andy Wallace? Well, <laughs> the track was very greasy because there's a lot of oil down, and with the water too, it was unbelievable. But all the, all the whole team did a superb job. I'm very happy to be here and very happy to be standing right here. Well, congratulations to you. We'll try and find uh, Elliot Forbes Robinson. Here he is. Hey, here I am. hey, congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. This is really a thrill. These guys did such a good job, and I'm really happy to be able to drive with them. And Max Crawford, who uh, organized our whole thing for the night and got us to uh, get good pit stops and keep up front even when we weren't the fastest car. It's been great. This was a wild one, too. You had to overcome a lot of things. The 16 car fell out. The weather was atrocious at times. You did a, a great job out there in that stuff. Oh, listen, it was great. Had a great car to work with, and this Dyson group puts the best, best car together. They make everybody look good, even me. It wasn't fun either, was it? Well, I don't know, man. I even enjoyed driving the rain. I usually don't. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. Well, Rob Dyson's down here somewhere, too. I'm not sure if he's made it into victory lane or not, but uh, some of the uh, competitors coming over and congratulating the Dyson Racing Team as they win for the second time the Rolex 24. All right, thanks very much, Bill. Rob Dyson still making his way to victory lane after driving the 16 car into the pits. Let's take a look at the final results in the Can-Am class. Second victory for Elliott Forbes Robinson, second also for Butch Leitzinger, and the third for Andy Wallace. The Ferrari team finishes in second place. Angelelli, Duradiguez, McNish, and Wayne Taylor, who got nowhere near as much time in the car as he would have liked as the team leader. And Stefan Johansson and his compatriots come home in third. Jim Downing and his Mazda-powered team in 11th place. As you look down through the rest of the field, the biggest field of Can-Am entries ever here at the Rolex 24, 21 strong. And for Lola, who returned to this race, an early exit, but they will be back. A part of the mechanical complexity of exotic machinery that makes this such a special event of the world of motorsports. Those are our Can-Am winners, but we have three more classes to talk to. Don't go away.